Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today, we're going to take a look at wealth and how it's being hidden by many people in order to avoid taxes and a variety of other reasons. My guest is an expert on this topic. Mr. Chuck Collins is an author and a senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., where he directs the program on inequality and the common good. He's an expert on economic inequality, and his recent book is The Wealth Hoarders, How Billionaires Pay Millions to Hide Trillions. Chuck Collins, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you, Bill, for having me. I appreciate you being with me. Timeliness is so important, and the title is so timely, and the book is so timely. It's a very well-written book. It's small, it's easy to read, but it's loaded with a lot of information. But what was your main purpose in writing this book? Well, I think a lot of us are waking up to how unequal the United States has become, even in the aftermath as we kind of come out of this pandemic, how, how we've pulled apart. Uh, but I kind of wanted to look at, you know, sometimes people talk about the billionaires, but I kind of want to look at the people who enable the billionaires, the, who facilitate uh, these inequalities by helping the wealthy hide money and kind of basically create these dynasties of wealth. Uh, so I was really intrigued by the professional helpers, the advisors that make these inequalities possible. Mm -hmm. Now, we've heard a lot about the military industrial complex over the years, but you're, you reference them as the wealth defense industry, the WDI, is that correct? Yeah, and that, I'm not the creator of that term. Uh, there's a number of uh, social scientists who've sort of talked in a more academic space about that, uh, including a sociologist, Jeffrey Winters, who writes about oligarchy. But the point is that, that uh, this is a sector, it's, it's almost a class of workers who devote their energy to helping the very wealthy stay wealthy uh, and have their wealth accumulate over time. And they are tax attorneys, wealth managers, uh, accountants uh, that all specialize in, in, in using certain tools to help hide wealth. And without, without them, uh, the wealthy would not be the wealthy would be paying more taxes and be more accountable in democratic societies. And we were talking about wealth and how much is basically hidden in offshore accounts or whatever, not paid to taxes. What are we talking about? 30, 35 trillion dollars or more? Uh, do we have a ballpark figure? Yeah, we, we unfortunately, because it's hidden, we don't know exactly. <laughs> but some but we have learned some things from leaks where people in the wealth defense industry have leaked data. We've learned something about what we call the tax gap, meaning you know, if, if these people have this much wealth, shouldn't they be paying taxes close to this amount? So there, there are some estimates and, 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 and the global estimate that I've heard is really a large range, but it's about 24 to $36 trillion is hidden by the wealthy. Now we're not talking about you know Uncle Joe hiding money in his mattress. We're talking about the richest one-tenth of 1%, people with $30 million or more, the ultra high net worths, that's, those are the folks who are hiding this vast amount of treasure. Mm -hmm. Now, years ago, when we talked about this, especially in the United States, so many people were fond of saying, well, just look at Central America, look at the income inequality down there, look at how the, the oligarchs, the, the wealthy, it's just a small percentage of the population. But today, they're looking at the United States, are they not? Well, you know, yeah, we've, we, in some ways, the United States is on track to be like Brazil, to be like some of these countries that had, you know, the 14 oligarch families that ruled the country and a tiny little barnacle of a middle class holding on and then a vast number of people uh, in precarious and economically insecure situations. And that's, we're kind of on track to that. I mean, I would say if we, if we, for the next 20 years followed the same trajectory that we've had for the last 40 years, we're gonna become even more extremely unequal. And that's alarming, really. Can, yeah, that's a good, very good point. Can we do that? How, how can a country survive? Right now, there's a huge debate over a, a massive infrastructure development bill, which most people believe we really need in this country. But if these people actually paid their taxes, we certainly wouldn't be debating over where we're going to get the money. But how much of this tax sheltering or evasion of taxes can a country stand before we reach crisis proportion? 
it's exactly the pickle that we're in, Bill, because if you think about it, huge amounts of income and wealth have flown to the, have gone up to this top one tenth of 1%. They're holding a larger share of society's treasure. And if we want to make the kind of public investments that we need to make just to kind of keep our electrical grids working and to kind of keep the highways working and keep basic infrastructure in place, wealthy people are going to have to pay their fair share of taxes. So that's why this is really a relevant discussion here. President Biden is proposing, let's put $2 trillion in, in infrastructure, badly needed infrastructure investment. But if the wealthy are able to sort of opt out of taxes or global corporations, uh, President Biden's proposal is to tax, to restore some of the, shut down some of these corporate tax loopholes to help pay for this infrastructure bill. Uh, if, if they're still dodging taxes, then we're, we're just going to have a big budget deficit and a big, bigger gap. So um, that's why I think this discussion is, is very relevant right now as we try to figure out how to make these both, how do we pay for the pandemic relief and the economic uh, you know, uh, support that we've needed over the last year? And how do we go forward to make the, the investments we need to have a decent society? Mm -hmm. And so often you hear the argument, in fact, it's been an argument ever since, I guess, Ronald Reagan was president uh, when it came to tax cuts. And we think back a few years ago with the Trump tax cut that gave really a large, almost, uh, I guess, $2.3 trillion, a large part of it went to the wealthiest of the wealthy. And they always have said that, well, this bill will pay for itself in the long run, which it never has. Uh, secondly, they say, well, this will create new jobs which in most cases, that doesn't seem to be the case because we had many of these corporations, large, very wealthy people who actually kept the money and laid people off. Uh, even the fossil fuel industry, in some cases, took, the, took some of the subsidies and then laid off tens of thousands of workers. So those arguments really need to be revisited, do they not? Yeah, I mean, I think that that, that trickle down theory, uh, we've now had a 40 year experiment you know, cutting taxes on the wealthy, cutting taxes on corporations. Does it create prosperity? Does it create jobs? Uh, the evidence is overwhelmingly no. Uh, it adds up to deficits. It accelerates inequality. Uh, and, and as you point out, the Trump tax cut gave, again, not small businesses, but these global transnational companies, huge tax breaks. Did they hire new people? No. That those, that many of those companies use that, those, those tax breaks to buy back their own stock and boost the share prices for top managers and shareholders. That's not creating prosperity and jobs. So it's, mm -hmm. as Paul Krugman says, it's kind of a zombie idea. It's like uh, keeps rising from the dead, but think about it. It serves wealthy people. It's a, it's an economic theory that is very good. If you're a, if you're a billionaire, you love trickle down economics, give me more tax breaks, exalt me with more. And uh, sure, I'll promise to do something eventually. You know, it's, it's, it's a discredited economic theory. What actually created this? It, how did we get to this stage? Because if we look back 20, 30 years ago, we weren't quite in, this, in, in it as deeply as we are today. But what caused this? Was it the fact that many of the wealthy donated to members of Congress who then set up favorable regulations and legislation to help them shelter even more money? Was this because of uh, political action committee funds or individual funds or dark money to members of Congress? Or what, what uh, really was the motivation or the impetus that pushed us in this direction? Because it seems like we're going there on steroids now. It seems that yeah. the more we try to slow it down, the faster we go. Yeah, I mean, the, the Bill, there's no single simple explanation uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I think that there were, if I were going to summarize it in a bumper sticker, though, I would say that the rules of the economy, tax policy, trade policy, government spending, the rules of the economy have tipped to benefit wealth owners at the expense of wage earners. And then if you do that for 40 years, then the wealthy get more wealth and power, and they use that wealth to further rig the rules of the economy and further push tax cuts and deregulation and policies that help them. So it's sort of like a vicious cycle, a compounding uh, inequality. And, and here we are, we went into this pandemic 
at this extremely high level of, of inequality. And I think it's the pandemic is in a way supercharged the inequality. So we're going to come out of the pandemic with even greater monopolies of big companies and more and more precarious people. Uh, we know that the billionaire class and during the pandemic over the last year has seen 660 billionaires together have seen their combined wealth go up $1.3 trillion while many people have lost their lives and livelihood and livelihoods and jobs and savings, you know? So I think, I think one of the unfortunate aspects of inequality is it sort of like accelerates uh, because of the, the capture. You, you point to campaign finance reform because of the way the political system is captured by big money and big influence. It's, it's really the combination of those things. And there are many people now who really legitimately argue that there should be no private contributions to political candidates, that all campaigns should be funded with public money. But people will argue, on the other hand, they'll say, well, I don't want a candidate X taking my money to run on ideas that I find to be very unpopular or don't like. But really, in the end, it's the people, the, the vast majority, also, let's just keep it to the US right now, Americans, 90% uh, or, or greater of the population, that's really paying the bills because these people are not paying their fair share. The folks are being taxed. Warren Buffett once said his secretary pays more <laughs> in taxes than a CEO does in, in some cases or percentage wise anyway. So it's really, we're paying for it on the front end or on the back end, are we not? Yeah, and I think that is one of the real ways in which this matters. The hidden wealth matters because it shifts the tax obligations off of the wealthy onto everyone else, or it leads to austerity, budget cuts, and the things that affect us. So, you know, you and I grew up at a time when if you were going to college, you didn't go into a decade of indentured servitude to get, a, uh, you know, a college degree. Uh, but now with the shift of tax obligations off the wealthy, states and localities are, you know, charging more for higher education to, you know, and the like. It, 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 it's an example where it's it, when you when the wealthy don't pay their fair share, the rest of us basically pick up the slack, either with more or higher taxes or cuts in services. We certainly do. It's <laughs> you're absolutely right. We can't avoid somebody has to pay the bill at some point. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with the PBS, our community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you have a podcast, or you just have a computer, you like our shows, you would like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're taking a look at wealth, the wealth accumulation and wealth hoarding at the same time. My guest is an expert on this topic. Mr. Chuck Collins is an author and a senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, DC, where he directs the program on inequality and the common good. He's an expert on economic inequality and his recent book is The Wealth Hoarders, How Billionaires Pay Millions to hide trillions. Chuck, that, that title really says it all. It really does. It brings it right to us. But before I forget it, though, you did mention to me earlier, and I want to be sure and put this out, wealthhoarders.com is your website where people can go to get more information. Is that is that correct? Wealthhoarders.com? Yeah, that's a resource. And you can see some of the media coverage and reviews of the book and links to the various places people can get the book. Um, and uh, even a couple of videos that we've created that are sort of explainer videos. So uh, I should say the other website that I co-edited is called inequality.org. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of a portal for research and information on these issues of inequality. So you should check out both of those. Yes, most assuredly, inequality.org. So be sure and do that. We were talking about wealthy people and uh, some of the folks have made gestures, I think, in the right direction. They've accumulated 
huge sums of money, tens of billions of dollars. Warren Buffett being one of them, Bill Gates, another, uh, Mackenzie Scott, uh, Jeff Bezos' ex-wife, who got it through a divorce settlement, I guess. But what types of actions are they taking or are planning to take to help make this a more equitable, equitable society and pay more of their fair share? Well, I think it's important to say philanthropy, there's some very important work being funded through philanthropy, but it's not a substitute to having an adequately uh, funded public sector with a fair tax system. And unfortunately, I think in the last couple of decades, we see wealthy people sort of opting out of paying their taxes and creating these private foundations, mm -hmm. which in a sense are taxpayer subsidized extensions of their private wealth and power. That said, there are some exemplary uses of philanthropy. You know, um, you know I think Bill Gates has been trying to solve problems like uh, you know, environmental problems and public health issues. Uh, there are people like Chuck Feeney who started the Atlantic Philanthropies who, 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 who gave all his wealth while he was alive to solve problems like public health infrastructure in regions around the world, very focused on trying to address inequality. Mackenzie Scott, formerly uh, Jeff Bezos's wife, is kind of putting the, putting the billionaire boys to shame because she, she literally came out a year ago. She got her share out of the divorce settlement and she wrote a letter. She, she joined the giving pledge, which is the billionaires who've said they're going to give, give away at least half their money or all their money in their lifetime. And she said, I'm going to empty the vault. I'm going to systematically work to move this, these billions of dollars. She probably has like 50 five billion dollars and just over 2020 she gave away six billion dollars she didn't create a big private foundation in her own name she literally moved that money directly to pandemic relief to addressing the racial economic divide uh very bold very direct not a lot of strings attached to her gifts really thoughtfully con contributed so those are examples where you know if you if if there are billionaires they they can follow the lead of some of these other exemplars. I know you, well, personally, as I understand it, you, now you were the grandson of Oscar Meyer from the Oscar Meyer meat packing company, which was a huge, it still is a huge operation. Uh, how did that affect you as someone who's in line to be an heir, to be involved in this company? Well, um, you know, yeah, I was born on third base, as I like to say. I, I won, the, <laughs> won the lottery at birth um, and, uh, you know, privileged to be part of this larger extended family. There's some remarkable people part of that family. I should say in 1981, it no longer became, you know, as a family business, it sold out to craft and, you know, a number of other, you know, different, different big fish swallowed the little fish, if you will. Uh, but but uh, I, I grew up with all kinds of advantages and privileges. And one insight that's connected to this book is there, you know, wealthy families have trusted financial advisors. They have people who advise them on where to invest their money, how to give it away, how to prepare the next generation to receive wealth. Um, and it gave me this window into this wealth protection, wealth defense industry, because their whole focus is on accumulation and building uh, more money, more wealth. And, and that's what I would call the dynasty protection business. That's the focus on the, the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. And this whole idea that you keep this wealth forever. And in order to do that, you have to avoid taxes because between having a lot of children and paying taxes, that wealth normally should disperse over generations instead of accelerate. Uh, and that's part of the anti-democratic concern I have about it. So I, I never really thought that this whole idea of wealth dynasties was a good idea for both individual family members as well as for society. So I didn't really choose or want to have any part of that. It was very commendable what you did. And of course, as you indicate, the more heirs there are, you re, it's a multiplier effect with diminishing returns. So it eventually it will uh, dissipate, I guess. Well, let me ask you, I know uh, we're just about out of time, but in conclusion, you had um, mentioned one time that you wanted to give a fictitious commencement speech 
to the graduates at Harvard University. And what would you say to them as far as, well, what you want to say, and also some of the steps that we can take to help resolve this problem, which is getting worse. It's not getting any better, it appears to be. Well, you know, one of the things that's interesting is I've interviewed lots of people who work in the wealth defense industry. I've worked, interviewed lawyers and wealth managers, and a lot of them actually regret that they've spent their entire lives helping a tiny sliver of the richest people in the world at the expense of all the other families in the world. And they have regrets about that. And so when I, when I wrote my mock commencement address to the Harvard Business School, I said, you know, um, don't work for the billionaires. There's plenty of really important work to be done in the world. You hear you're getting this business skill training, you're getting these skills that in, in money and financial management, don't go work for the richest people and, and just devote your own life to making them richer. Find something else to do. There's plenty of good paying, meaningful work. And that was really my message. And uh, so I do think encouraging people in that profession to find other jobs is part of the fix, but ultimately it's a system problem. Uh, and I would just say there's four really important things we can do. One is enforcement. We need to enforce the existing tax rules. Here in the United States, the Internal Revenue, Revenue Service has been decimated of the people who know how these elaborate tax dodges work. The IRS spends more time cracking down on low and middle income people who get the earned income credit than they do focusing on the super rich who use these trusts and other devices. So enforcing tax payments by the wealthy. The second thing is to require transparency, re require global companies, re require local companies to disclose who are the beneficial owners. And that would certainly help law enforcement people around the country who are trying to figure out who's, who's hiding money around the, play, the world, you know, criminal activity. Third is we should just outlaw certain kinds of trusts and tax loopholes that have no societal purpose other than avoiding taxes. And finally, we need to gather, get together with people in, in England and other European countries and form a global system of transparency and, and country by country tax reporting. Um, and the good news is it, this is totally fixable. And we in the United States need to get our own house in order. We need to clean up our own act, but then we need to rejoin the rest of the world in creating a healthy global economy. And, um, but it's totally, uh, I'm optimistic that if we come together and understand how this works, we can, we can reverse these trends. Those are very logical and very, I think, practical solutions that we can implement. And you're talking about the global, it, it somewhat has to be a global outreach. I think now, if we look at the United Nations, which is still the only multilateral institution in the world, uh, the UN cannot raise taxes. They have no authority to do that. But That's could the UN take the lead in that as far as bringing together the 193 countries of the world that are in the General Assembly to promote a discussion of this, to promote transparency? And I know they're doing it in some of their agencies, but could it be elevated to be a General Assembly activity that would get more coverage, more media coverage, and would have, uh, I guess, stronger voices pushing in this direction? You know, I think, I think the, the UN would be a really important place to have a discussion about the global costs of these hidden wealth systems, because these are the systems by which the wealthy uh, elites of countries in the global south siphon money out of those countries. Uh, these are the ways in which uh, the great, you know, plundering, if you will, of many, many mineral rich countries occurs. Interesting thing, Bill, uh, Sec Federal Reserve uh, Chair Janet Yellen in the last couple of days announced this idea of they should, we should establish a global minimum tax rate. Now that can't be enforced through the UN, but it could be enforced through treaties. If you wanna join the economic club of the prosperous nations, you need, we need to have a minimum global tax rate. So these companies aren't playing countries off against each other. And I think a corollary to that is you, you shut down these secrecy jurisdictions. You know, these are tiny little island nations. If they wanna be part of the global economy, uh, 
they shouldn't sell out their nations to the tiny little wealth management industry in those countries. They, they, that, that's not their economic bread and butter. Um, so I actually think there, there could be global pressure brought to bear that would fix this system. This has to be the direction we're going to move in, I hope. But, but anyway, Chuck Collins, uh, great job on the, your new book, The Wealth Hoarders, How Billionaires Pay Millions to Hide Trillions. But I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you for your thoughtful questions and comments. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television. <laughs>